All right, good morning. Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to class. This morning, you can uh, thank my wife and I for the great weather this morning. Um, it's good to be back. We did have a good time. Uh, had some good weather and restful time uh, on our trip, which is good, but it's, it's also good to be back. You should have in front of you a set of notes, Lesson 26, External Evidence for Inspiration, the Transmission of the Text. So this is going to be um, the second to last study in this first series, or first section of the class. So after next week, I'm going to wrap up a study of inspiration next Sunday, and then I'm going to take a break from these studies for a while to read ahead and prepare in advance for when we resume the class again in, in uh, September. So uh, in two weeks from today, we're going to start the uh, study through Colossians. And I think Lee's doing the first, he's doing the introduction to Colossians in the Adult Sunday School Hour two weeks from today. So I'm going to teach on this topic today and then next week, and then we're going to go on our summer schedule and uh, finish out the spring and the summer with some of the other men teaching on uh, the book of Colossians. So uh, lesson 26, if you would look at the introduction, it says, beginning with lesson 24, we adopted a more evidentialist approach and began looking at some of the external proofs for inspiration. In order to accomplish this task, I told you that we would consider the following three points. We're going to look at number one, the historicity of the Old Testament. We did that in Lesson 24. The historicity of the New Testament. We did that, what, three weeks ago now when we looked at Lesson uh, 25 on the historical reliability of the New Testament. And then we're also going to spend a little bit of time talking today about the transmission of the text here in Lesson Chapter 26 as the third one of our sort of external proofs of inspiration. I have more to say about that in a minute. In Lessons 24 and 25, we looked at the external evidence for inspiration by studying the historicity of both the Old and New Testaments. There's much more that could be said about the historical reliability of the Bible that is beyond the space I wish to devote to this topic in this class. I told you in Lesson 24 and 25 that there's a whole bunch more material out there for you to look at uh, regarding the reliability, historical reliability of the Bible. So if, you, if you're interested in those things, um, I can direct you to some things you might want to read. There's ample websites out there, tons of information about biblical archaeology on the internet, in magazines, all over if, if you're interested in those things. This week we want to consider the third and final point identified above, namely the transmission of the text. Once again, my intention in this lesson is not to exhaust all that could be said about the topic. In fact, as, we will see, as you will see moving forward, a discussion of textual issues will play a big role in the class. What I want to do today is just talk about a few basic things. What we're going to do when we resume in September is really begin to expand upon these and look at these things in more detail. So if you want to view this as sort of a, uh, a taste of what's going to come later on, it, it'd probably be appropriate to think of it that way. This morning we just want, this morning we will not seek to cast judgment upon any of the manuscript witnesses. This morning I'm not going to try to identify what are good manuscripts, if you will, as opposed to maybe not so good manuscripts. I'm not going to be doing any of that. That's not the point of this lesson. The point of this lesson is just to look at the manuscript witnesses that are available for the New Testament and the Bible in general and then compare that with what else is available for other books and works of antiquity. So this morning we're not going to seek to cast judgment upon any of the manuscripts, rather we will just discuss them in a general sense. In future lessons we will discuss them more critically and seek to identify criteria for distinguishing between sound and unsound manuscripts. So just to be clear, we're not going to get into that this morning. The very fact that the Bible was copied so extensively speaks to the fact that people believed it to be the Word of God and of divine authority. I want you to understand this point. One of the things that speaks to the, to the inspiration of the Scripture is that the Scripture is unlike any other book of antiquity in that it was so frequently copied. Okay, What that tells you is that the people that are doing that hold the Bible in some sort of a higher esteem or higher regard than the other, uh, works, of uh, other works of antiquity and history. So in order to accomplish our purpose this morning, we'll touch upon a few points regarding the transmission of both the Old and the New Testament. So if you would turn to Romans chapter 3 to get started on this. Now this point, 
here uh, about the Old Testament is something that we will have a lot more to say about when we resume in September. But just a few things for your consideration here this morning. The Old Testament. The writers of the Old Testament were... Who wrote the Old Testament by and large? Moses. Jewish people, right? Members of the nation of Israel. Moses, David, Solomon, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. These are, all, these are all circumcision folks, right? These are all members of the nation of Israel that are writing the Old Testament. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 1. It says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Who has committed the oracles of God according to Romans 3, 2? Israel, right? So in time past, dispensationally in time past, does Israel enjoy, one of, the, one of the things that Israel enjoys, one of the benefits that Israel enjoys in time past, is that God spoke to and through that nation, and He committed His oracles, He committed His writings to that nation. That nation and their member, its members, write the Old Testament, okay? And so Paul is, Paul is pointing this out. Now, even within that nation, come over to Deuteronomy 31, even within that nation, the, there's a specific group of folks that are given the task of the oversight and the copying and the handling of the Scripture. It's not just left to you know, average, the average Joe in Israel to do this. God ordains it such that the tribe of Levi is going to be responsible. So I'm sure most of you are aware of the fact that in the Old Testament, under the law, in time past, there was such a thing that we now refer to as the, Le the Levitical priesthood, right? That the tribe of Levi belonged to God and that they were the ones that were to labor in the office of the priesthood and so forth in, nation of, in the nation of Israel. Well, one of the things that they were charged with is the responsibility of the word of God within Israel. Look at verse 24. And it came to pass when Moses made an end of the writing of the words of the law in a book <clears throat> until they were finished that Moses commanded who? The Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Uh, behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have rebelled against the Lord, and how much more after my death? Gather me, gather unto me all the elders of the tribes and your officers, and I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to re uh, call heaven and earth to rec record against them. So my point there is, mo when Moses is done writing the law, who does he give it to? He gives it to the Levites. What do the Levites do with it? They put it in the ark, right? And whose responsibility is the care and oversight of the ark, the contents of the ark, and the rest of the, and the, rest of the tabernacle? That, that is something that the Levites are responsible for. Go back to Deuteronomy 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 10. Verse 2, And I will write on tables the words which are written in the first tables, which thou breakest, and thou, should put, and thou shalt put them where? In the ark. And I, may, and, and I made an ark of shittim wood, hewed out of two tables of stone unto the first, and went up into the mount, having the two tables in my hand. And he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them unto me. And I turned myself, and came down from the mount, and I put the tables in the ark which I made, and there they may be, as the Lord commanded me. And the children of Israel took their journey, uh, we, we actually don't need to read that part. We can, we can skip that just for the sake of time. So Moses places the Ten Commandments. In, in chapter 10, he's placing just those Ten Commandments in the ark. Okay, The, the passage we read in, in uh, 31 is referring to the whole law. Why don't you go back to Deuteronomy 31? Go back to Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31, look at verse 9. 
And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the son of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God, in the place which he chose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Who's going to do that? The Levites. the Levites. So Moses gives them the law. He gives it to the Levites. The Levites put it in the ark there. And it's going to be their job every seven years, according to the passage, to read in the hearing of the nation of Israel this law. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe all the words of this law, and that their children which have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God <clears throat> as long as ye live in the land whither ye go, whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. So Romans chapter 3 says that who were the oracles of God committed to? No, it just says to Israel, right? To the circumcision. Within that circumcision, what particular group in Israel was charged with the oversight and the reading and the teaching and the instruction of the law? It was the Levites, okay? So the Ten Commandments, the entire law, they're all placed in the ark. And every seven years, they're to stand and, and, and hear those things read. Now, for the sake of time, come over to Ezra. There's more we could say about that out of the law itself, but let's just go to Ezra 7. <clears throat> Ezra chapter 7, verse 6. Ezra chapter 7, verse 6. It says, This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. Who is Ezra? A scribe. E Ezra's a scribe. He's a scribe. The, the text defines him as a scribe of what? Now, if Ezra, let me ask you a question. If Ezra is a Bible believing Israelite, and he's a scribe, what tribe would you surmise he's from? Okay, let's read on. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests, according to, according to the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, notice, and of who? The priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nephims uh, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Now drop down to verse 10. For Ezra had, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and what? Now where's he going to teach? Where's he going to find that material? He's going to find it in the law, right? Verse 11. And this is the copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statute to what? Now, what does verse 11 call what you have in front of you? What does it call it? A copy. Is it in the Bible? Does the Bible furnish you with this copy that Ezra made? Okay. So is Ezra a priest? One of his jobs as a priest, as a Levite, as a scribe, is to do what? Copy out the scriptures. Okay. So my point in all this, for the time being, is that God did not simply allow His Word to be handled and copied by anyone in Israel. Okay? In the Old Testament, he, is, he established a specific group of men, the Levitical priesthood, whose job it was to see to the care and copying of the Word of God. E Ezra is an example of that. Okay? Ezra is an example of somebody who is a scribe, who is a Levite, 
who is charged with the copying and distribution and teaching of this information. Verse 11 said again, now this is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord. So what is he, what is he copying according to verse 11? He's copying not only the letter from Artaxerxes, but he's also a scribe of the words of the commandments of who? The Lord, and it says, and of his statutes to who? To Israel. Okay, so even, with, even within Israel, who had been had the advantage in time past of having the oracles of God committed unto them, there's a particular tribe, a particular group of men in that nation that are charged with the responsibility of the oversight, copying, teaching, and instruction of Israel in the law of God. Okay, So the Levitical scribes knew they were duplicating God's word, so they went to incredible lengths to prevent error from creeping into their work. This whole process of copying the Bible was controlled by strict religious rituals, and scribes carefully counted every line, word, syllable, and letter to ensure accuracy. Prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, the oldest existing Old Testament manuscript is known as the Masoretic Text. Okay, Now, that is the Hebrew text supporting the King James Bible. You, sh you should be aware of that. Okay, Which dates from around 900 A.D. So the, the oldest surviving copy of the Masoretic Text dates from roughly 900 A.D. Before the discovery of what? Dead sea. The Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. Among the manuscripts found in the Dead Sea Scrolls were fragments and two copies of the book of Isaiah. The copies of the book of Isaiah date to around 150 B.C. How much time is that? <coughs> What's that? That's, that, that's a thousand plus years, right? Okay. So this is the Masoretic text. Make sure I spell that right. And this would be copies of Isaiah from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I'll finish that point. The copies of the book of Isaiah date to around 150 B.C., almost 1,000 years older than the Masoretic text. Okay? The comparison of the two sources prove to be word-for-word -word identical with our standard Hebrew Bible in more than 95% of the text. The 5% variation consisted chiefly of obvious slips of the pen and variations in spelling. So th these two things over this thousand year time period are 95% what? Exact same. Okay, 95% word for word identical. The 5% that they identify, the 5% difference that they identify there fall into those categories that they, that, uh, that are listed there. Uh, variations in spelling and slips of the pen or clear instances where um, there's a stray mark or something of, something of those lines, right? So if you take that thousand year plus time period between the, 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 these manuscripts that date from the Dead Sea Scrolls find from 1947 from the book of Isaiah and you compare them to the book of Isaiah that's found in the copy of the Masoretic text from, uh, from 900 AD they're 95 percent word for word identical and the 5 the percent variation comes in issues related to variation in spelling and clear places where stray marks or something like that where uh, a line or something like that is, is, is added or not there or something like that with, within that right so if you think about now are they doing that with your notes our exact photostatic copy of the notes I have right so whatever I put together and they edited you got that's amazing that over that whole period of time between 150 BC all the way to 900 AD that you have that sort of accuracy within the within the Old Testament text okay 
So that tells you then that all this material that we've been going over so far about the tribe of Levi and about their, the way they would handle the scriptures and the attitude that they had toward what they were doing, did they transfer that text very accurately from that time all the way to 900 AD that we have access to today? Okay, so again, this is, this is just some basic information about how that text gets from the Old Testament author to you. And then the King James translators between 1604 and 1611, they take that text and they translate it into what? English. <clears throat> So what you, have, what you have in your English Bible, in the King James Bible, uh, it answers to that, which is 95% word for word what was existed in 150 BC. Okay? Now that, that should tell you something about the attitude of the people involved in this process. So let me finish this point and then we'll see if there's any comments. In addition... In addition to being historical confirmation of the, of the Bible doctrine of preservation, not just of the thoughts, but of the words themselves, these factors also serve as, as strong external evidence of the inspiration of those words. Okay? Now, I, I'm going to ask if there's any questions or comments, and just so you know, if, if, the, if a question is asked that takes us further than where I want to go at this point, I'm just going to say I'll answer that when we resume, okay? But does anybody have any general questions, comments, thoughts, or observations about the Old Testament transmission? Is everybody understanding what we just covered here? Well, just one thing that, that, that's, that's extremely accurate, because if you told somebody something and passed it around, it wouldn't be that accurate. Yeah, I mean, if, if this was passed down by verbal communication, right, the whole telephone game, right? Yeah. I come over here and I tell Mike something, and then he tells Sylvia, and he tells Dave, and by the time we get all the way over there to Craig, what? It's, it's, it'll, it'll be more than 5% off. It's going to be more than 5% off what was originally said, right? So that's, again, that speaks to, remember, remember we talked about this. We talked about written revelation, right? So I'm going all the way back. Written revelation was accomplished how? By inspiration, right? What that is speaking to has something to do with what? Preservation. The preservation, preservation of that of that written revelation. Now, this this right here is what we're going to get into when we resume class in September. A study of that doctrine. Just like we took inspiration and we went through the scriptures and we flushed out what does the Bible say about inspiration. Uh, how was inspiration accomplished? What's God's attitude toward it? Uh, what's the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ toward the written word? And all, that, all those things that we covered. When we get here, we're going to be looking at, well, what does the Bible say about what's going to happen to that what? Inspiration. Folks, if you, just, if you just look at what we just went over, when God gives Israel the law, is he like, okay, I'm done. Or does he tell them, okay, here's what you do. You take that, you give it to Levi, the Levites, and they put it there. And they keep it. Every seven years, Israel's going to meet, and you're going you're to read it to them. Right? Eventually, they start copying it out. And who's going to copy it out? It's going to be guys like Ezra. It's going to be guys that are responsible, that are of that tribe, that tribe of Levi. They're going to be responsible for that process. Uh, and through that process, the text gets to you and I today. But that's, that's this doctrine here. We're not, we're not that far yet. What I'm talking about here is sort of just a foretaste of what we're going to be looking at when we study the issue of preservation. Okay. Now, notice, some of you I've been talking to about issues about spelling, right? Even in that, there's variation in what? Spelling. Okay. So if... If, if, the, if one text spells a word one way, another text spells it a different way, but it's still clearly the same word, just spelled two different ways, are we going to lose our mind over that? I don't think you should do that. Okay? But again, any other questions or comments? Because we, we need to have enough time to look at the New Testament here. Okay. So, transmission of the New Testament. 
<coughs> there is also much evidence to support the reliability and inspiration of the New Testament. Let's consider the following three areas. Number one, we want to look at early eyewitness testimony. Number two, we want to look at the short time gap. And number three, we want to look at the number of available witnesses. Okay? So the New Testament writers, go over to Luke chapter 1, they were either eyewitnesses themselves or they interviewed eyewitnesses. They either were eyewitnesses themselves to the events recorded or they interviewed folks who were. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 2. Now, we kind of looked at this already uh, briefly when we studied three weeks ago. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were what? Eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Does Luke claim to have interviewed eyewitnesses? Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, some of this material, some of you probably heard this before hundred different ways. It's been at least six years since I've taught on any of this stuff here at the church. Others of you, this uh, might be new information. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4, And then he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Then was he seen of Cephas, that's Peter, right? Did he see him? Eyewitness, right? Then of who? Did the, 12, did the rest of the twelve see him? After that, he was seen of five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then all of the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of who? Of me, of Paul. Okay. So, how many people? Cephas, the twelve, five hundred people. He was seen of James, then all the apostles, and then who? Paul. All of those were all those folks eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. Okay? Come over to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his what? Majesty. Now, why is this issue about eyewitness testimony important? Look at the next statement in your notes. We convict people in court, in a court of law, every day in this nation based upon the testimony of what? Eyewitnesses. These writers, Paul, Peter, the other, the other folks that write the New Testament, Luke, they either were eyewitnesses themselves or they interviewed what? Eyewitnesses. So the New Testament documents were written within a 35 with written within 35 years of the events recorded. No other religious or secular document from antiquity can make this claim, okay? So there's only a 30 there's it's probably less than that. That's being generous, frankly. There's a 35 year time span between the event recorded and when it's actually what? Written down. So anybody that's doing this writing within this 35 year time frame, they're either eyewitnesses themselves or they've interviewed what? The eyewitnesses necessary to get the, uh, to, uh, for the information. Now if you look at the, the notes there, we've already went over this. Luke 1, we know that the book of Luke is, is part one of a two part what? Two part treatise, right? Luke is the first part. The second part is what? Yes. Acts. So if you think about this, if you start in the book of Luke, Luke 1 starts with the announcement of Christ's birth. Okay, The angel comes and announces to Mary that she's going to uh, have a son and all that sort of thing, right? Then this takes you all the way out to Paul's imprisonment where? In Rome. So you have all that information from the announcement of the birth of Christ all the way out to Paul's imprisonment written within the 35 year time span of the events recorded. Written by eyewitnesses or those who interviewed what? Eyewitnesses. Mainly in this case Luke. But during this time Paul's writing, during the time period covered by the book of Acts in here, Paul's writing his epistles. Paul's epistles are written. 
And is Paul an eyewitness? Yes. So you have all this stuff happening within a short period of time. So what does that tell you? The more time that goes on, do you have a greater chance of legendary and false material entering if there's a greater time, fr greater time frame between those things? So that leads me to the next point, the short time gap. Many other religious documents have tremendous time spans between when they were transmitted orally and when they were eventually written down. For example, the sayings of Buddha were not recorded until 500 years after his death. Now, I have a question for you. Does anybody out there doubt whether or not we've properly understood Buddha? Besides you, Lee. I'm trying to make a point about those outside of Christianity or unbelievers. Do they doubt and make a big deal about whether or not we've properly understood the teachings of Buddha? No. no. Yet there's a 500 year time frame between when Buddha originally uttered the statements and when they were finally what? Written down, right? Yet for the New Testament, there's only how much time? 35 years. And again, that's being, in my opinion, somewhat generous. So, regarding the New Testament documents, unlike other ancient works, whether secular or religious, not enough time elapsed between when Jesus spoke and when his words were recorded to allow for misrepresentation or development of legendary material. So, I have a few things to look at here. So, this chart shows you the approximate time span between the original thing written and the first surviving copy. Okay? So look at the New Testament. How much not even not even 200 years between when the New Testament documents were written and the first surviving what? Copy. Now look at Homer's Iliad. Over 600 years. Now does any literature teacher tell their literature students, you know, we're just really not sure whether or not we've properly understood Homer's Iliad. Do they do that? No, of, course not. of course they don't do that. Okay? Why don't they do that? <laughs> they don't have to be accountable to Homer's Iliad. They don't have to be accountable to Homer's Iliad for anything, right? But if you start looking at this, um, Thucydides, history of the Peloponnesian War. That's the wars between Athens and Sparta. Look at the amount of time, over 1,200, probably 1,300 years. When I took my master's degree in military history, I had to read that thing. Okay? Oh. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful time, let me tell you. But the professor never said, hey, listen, guys, we need to have a discussion about whether or not we have an accurate understanding of what Thucydides said. Why didn't he do that? He doesn't care, right? But then all of a sudden, when it comes to the New Testament, if you take the same standard used to judge all of these other ancient documents, where is there ultimately far more reason to believe in the reliability of the document using the standards of secular historians you guys following my point here yeah. okay but yet the Bible is always what questioned it's always wrong it's always ridiculed here's the number of language manuscripts so this one shows you the time period between the original of Homer's Iliad and the earliest surviving copy, okay? So about 500 years. This one is showing you the number of surviving manuscripts or witnesses to how that should read. There are 5,300 plus manuscripts that speak to, how, that, that speak to the New Testament when compared with 643 of Homer's Iliad. Now ultimately, we're going to study that maybe not all of those New Testament manuscripts are so trustworthy, but that's a, that's a study for a different day. Right now I just want you to see is how many more New Testament manuscripts are there when you compare it to Homer's Iliad? Thousands. Thousands. Yet, does anybody say, geez, I don't think we've understood Homer properly? No. Here we see, just in a different way, so this breaks it down. So you have Homer's Iliad, written in about 800 B.C. The earliest surviving copy is from about 400 B.C. So that's a time gap of about 400 years, and there's 643 copies. 
Uh, we'll look at Thucydides. Again, that's the history of the Peloponnesian War, written between 460 and 400 BC. Earliest surviving copy is from about 900 AD. About 13, uh, about 13, 1,350 years. How many copies? Eight. Does anybody question whether or not we've understood that right? Or have accurate representation of what Thucydides said? Now, look here at the New Testament data. Fragments. Fragments of the New Testament date from within 50 years of the writing of the New Testament. That's little pieces. Okay? Entire books from 100 years. Most of the New Testament from 150 years. Complete New Testaments from somewhere in there from uh, uh, 225 years. And I'll add, that's only talking about Greek manuscripts. That's not talking about translations of those manuscripts into other early what? Languages. Okay? So this data here is simply looking at Greek manuscripts. So again, 5,366 compared to what? Not, nothing even close to that total if you add all the other ones up. Yet, does anybody question whether or not we have accurate understandings of those things? No. So back to your notes. <coughs> Number of available witnesses. So this is all kind of running together, but that's fine. <laughs> There are more extant manuscripts of the New Testament there than there are for any ten works of ancient history combined. Okay? I already showed you the chart, this chart. That was what I had there. Let's look at this next one. There are over 86,000 known quotations of Scripture made by the church fathers. And even if we did not have any copies of the New Testament, we could still reconstruct all but 11 verses of the entire New Testament from material written by the church fathers within 150 to 200 years of the life of Christ. Okay, so here's the chart. This, this column shows you the writer. This shows you the number of quotations. So for example, Irenaeus quotes from the Gospels 1,038 times. Okay, the book of Acts, 149 times, Paul's epistles, sh shade under 500, 23 times in the general epistles, and 65 times for the book of Revelation for that total right there. Okay, you come all the way down, you take the grand totals of all the patristic quotations from the New Testament, and they come out to about 36,289 times the church fathers quoted from the New Testament. If you took all the totality of all of that, you could reconstruct the New Testament sh uh, shy of about 11 verses simply from the quota extensive quotations of the New Testament made by the church fathers. So, again, the evidence here, is there anything that even comes close to this kind of evidence for other works of secular antiquity? No. Nothing. Nothing even close. So I'm on the top of page four. There is more evidence for the reliability of the New Testament text than for any ten pieces of classical literature combined. The Bible is in better textual shape than the 37 plays of William Shakespeare written in the 17th century after the invention of the printing press. Okay? People do not question whether they have accurately understood Plato, Aristotle, or Socrates. Yet they will doubt the veracity of the biblical text when there is exponentially more historical slash textual evidence supporting the New Testament. All of this demonstrates the huge bias that people have against the Bible in their thinking. So in other words, if you are a reasonable, honest, fair person... And you're not going to question Thucydides or Plato or Aristotle or Socrates and whether or not we've understood that stuff or, or Homer or Livy or some other ancient writer. You have no reason based upon that evidence, if handled fairly, to even doubt that we actually have God's Word. And that God's Word has been what? Preserved. Preserved. Okay, now how that was accomplished and stuff, we're going to still talk about that in the future. All right, but this is a sort of a, a setting us up, if you will, to do that. 
Does anybody have any questions or comments about point two? Now, I would dare say most of you have heard this material before. You've either heard it taught on or read the books that talk, that talk about this stuff. Um, a big one would be Josh McDowell's, you know, the evidence that demands a verdict. He's got a whole section in there. He's one of the first guys to really hit that, this evidentiary stuff pretty hard in that book. And since then, you know, a ton of other things have been written by Christian authors expanding upon what things McDowell said and, and, and so on, okay? Does anybody have any questions or comments about that? Or feel that I left something out that should be mentioned? Yeah? How, how long did Luke uh, take to record these events? I mean, what time frame? It seems like they recorded really quickly and compiled really quickly as far as years. Oh, yeah. I, 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 under, I understand that it, it took almost a, uh, a generation for the, the war of Vietnam for works to start coming out that are considered definitive historical things. I don't even know of anything from the Iraq War that okay so there's two the, two comments then to your to the th point you bring up I am drawing a blank right now from the last study what year did Geisler say acts had to be written by 63 66 65 let's just cut the difference and say 64 so let's say you take 64 for the end of the book of Acts Let's say you take 33 as the year Christ died. Okay? Already that's less than how many years? 35 for the majority of the New Testament to be written, right? So, and then if you understand that Acts is the, is the second part of a two-part what? Two-part treatise. So if you're gonna if you're gonna understand, then you gotta back Luke up and put it between Acts. And when Christ died, right? So I, I don't know the exact year, Mike. All I can say is that it's Luke is doing his investigative work and all that, and his writing work within that roughly 30-year time frame. Okay. Now the other th question that you raise, Mike brought up. You know, uh, took how many uh, 30 years for a definitive work to be written on Vietnam? Well, we didn't start hearing anything about it until the late Okay. 70s. So I have two comments about that. First of all, ultimately, yes, Luke is doing all this stuff, but ultimately, who's the author of that stuff? The Holy Spirit, right? Because it's all written by what? Inspiration, Inspiration right? So Luke is doing the things necessary. The Holy Spirit is also involved in that. We've already discussed all that, right? So you can have the Holy Spirit's definitive history within a 30-year time frame, and I have no problem with that. Okay, because of the nature of what's going on. To your second point there about typically what happens is uh, th those that study, you could study history and then you could also study historiography. You ever heard of that word? I'm probably spelling it wrong. But historiography is different from history. Historiography studies the development of the history books over time. Okay, so if you take, uh, I, I wrote my, if for, for my undergraduate work, one of the papers I had to write, I wrote a paper on Reagan, a historiographical sketch on Reagan. Okay, and so what I did is I started with the books that were written in the 80s while he was still in office on, on his administration. Then I started, I looked at books from the early 90s, or just after he left office. And I wrote this paper in about 2001, okay? And then I looked at it in the late 90s, like, uh, in, you know, 1995 through 2000, uh, at the tail end of the Clinton administration, right? And what you see when you study historiography is that interpretations of Reagan's presidency, what? Change over time, right? This, this practice of historiography is basically what I did when doing the Grace History Project. We looked at Darby, right? And we understood, okay, what was Darby's dispensational understanding? And then we, looked, then we moved out a generation after Darby and we saw how that, that understanding what? 
grew and enlarged and changed and became more specified and, and, and so on and so forth, right? So just, I, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but that's not what's going on here. This is something that goes on with man's history when men write history about stuff. Okay, it, the interpretation changes over time. The same, thing, the same thing is going to be true for Obama's presidency as it's been true of Washington. And then different generations of historians come along and they, they write stuff that interpret things differently. And that's where you start getting into a bunch of controversy and all that sort of thing. But that's, historiography is that study. Any questions about that? How many of you are familiar with that word? So, so that's what Mark Ehrman is, is approaching from that perspective. He, he debunks the, um, the Book of Acts, it's complete fabrication and uh, so forth. If, yeah, because he's approaching the Book of Acts as though it's just a human right. authored document. He's taking who out of it? He's taking God the Holy Spirit out of the equation. And he's treating it the same way you would treat any book. See, that's the problem here, right? If you're going to treat the Bible the same way you would treat Thucydides, well, okay, if I'm not a believer, I guess I can at least understand why a non-believer would want to do that. But if I'm a believer and I'm trying to understand God's Word as God, in line with what God says about it in His Word, then that seems to me it ought to affect how I view the process. Okay? we got one more point here to finish. <laughs> the charge of circular reasoning. Unbelievers accuse Christians of using circular reasoning and unsupported assumptions to justify their beliefs. Christians allegedly take unsupported assumptions and use them to justify other unsupported assumptions, in effect using fiction to support fiction. Here is a sample conversation that is illustrative of the Christian use of circular reasoning with respect to the Bible being the Word of God according to unbelievers. Unbelievers question, how do you know the Bible is true? How do you know it's the Word of God? Believers answer, because the Bible says it is God's Word. The Bible is internally consistent and harmonious. Its writers who lived thousands of years apart agree on the same message. It also contains many fulfilled prophecies and so on and so forth, right? So we've looked at most of that stuff. Definition. A use of reason in which the premises depend on depend on or is equivalent to the conclusion. A method of false logic by which the, uh, this is used to prove that and that is used to prove this, also called circular logic. So look at this here, okay? So, the Bible is the Word of God. But how can we be sure that the Bible is the Word of God? Because the Bible tells us it's the Word of God. But why believe the Bible? Because the Bible is infallible, but how do you know it's infallible? Because the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that obviously uh, skeptics and agnostics and atheists are going to, you know, point out. And I want to address this here at the end of this lesson. Another definition of circular reasoning is a formal logical fallacy in which the proposition to be proved is assumed implicitly or explicitly in one of the premises. For example, only an untrustworthy person would run for office. The fact that politicians are untrustworthy is proof of this. Okay? So, the common... Boy, I'm going to have to hustle through this here. The common accusation that Christians use circular reasoning is in a sense actually true. In fact, everyone uses some degree of circular reasoning when defending his ultimate standard, though not everyone realizes this fact. All, philo all philosophical systems start with axioms or presuppositions or non-provable positions accepted as true and deduce theorems from them. Therefore, Christians should not be faulted for having axioms as well. We are in, we are, which are the presuppositions of Scripture? A presupposition is a fact about something, example, God is love. So the question for any axiomatic system is, is whether it is self-consistent and consistent with the real world. Now, Craig was talking about this weeks and weeks ago, right? Does every worldview have certain presuppositions? 
those presuppositions or axioms, those are just accepted by that worldview, right, as being, as being the case. One of them for us is that the Bible is what? Is the Word of God, okay? Self-consistency means that axioms do not contradict each other. Indeed, allegedly circular reasoning at least demonstrates the internal consistency of the Bible's claims it makes about itself. If the Bible had actually disclaimed divine inspiration, it would be it, it would indeed be illogical to defend it. Look, does the Bible claim to be does the Bible say it's inspired? Yes. So if the Bible says it's inspired, and I believe it's inspired, and I go to that verse in 2 Timothy 3.16 to say, hey, the Bible's inspired, am I contradicting what the Bible says about itself? No. Okay? So hopefully you're following that. Consider, consistent with the real world. So there's, the, number one, it has to be consistent. Number one, it has to be self-consistent. Number two, it has to be consistent with the real world. Christian axioms provide the basis for a coherent worldview, i.e. a thought map that can guide us throughout all aspects of life. Non-Christian axioms fail these tests, as do the axioms for other, quote, holy books. Biblical axioms logically and historically provide the basis for modern science. A major one is that the universe is orderly because it was made by a God of order, not the author of confusion. But why should the universe be orderly? Orderly, if there were no God, or if Zeus and his gang were in charge, or if the universe were one big thought as Eastern religions teach, it could change its mind. Also very importantly, the Christian axioms provide us a basis for objective right and wrong. Note it is important to understand the point here. Note that atheists cannot be moral. Can What? Not that atheists cannot be moral, but that they have no objective basis for this morality from within their own system. Okay? Now, that's, they get all bent out of shape. If you ever talk to an atheist, they'll argue with you six ways from Sunday about that point. Okay? Because they understand that it's a problem for them. Christian axioms also provide a basis for voluntary choice, since we are made in the image of God. But evolutionists believe that we are just machines, and that our thoughts are really, uh, <coughs> are really motions of atoms in our brains, which are just computers made of meat. They actually believe that. But then they realize that we cannot function in the everyday world like this. Science is supposed to be about predictability. Yet an evolutionist can, uh, yet an evolutionist can far more easily predict behavior if he treats his wife as a free agent, which uh, with desires and dislikes. With desires and dislikes. For example, if he brings her flowers, <clears throat> then he will make her happy. I.e., for all practical purposes, his wife is a free agent who likes flowers. Nothing is gained in the practical world by treating her as an automaton, which, which with certain olfactory responses programmed by uh, genus that, uh, that in turn produce certain brain chemistry. So evolutionists, so evolutionists claim that free will is a useful illusion. Now, I know this is getting sort of philosophical and technical here, but the point is this, right? All of the Christian axioms and the Christian presuppositions, are they all internally consistent to themselves? Okay? The axioms and presuppositions of the skeptic and the agnostic and the atheist, do they break down because in a practical life they're not going to work? And that's really not how people what? Think, behave, function, and so forth. So, the truth is that everyone uses some degree of circular reasoning when defending their ultimate standard, though not everyone realizes this fact. Yet, if used properly, the use of circular reasoning is not arbitrary and therefore not fallacious. Contrary to popular belief, circular reasoning is surprisingly a valid argument. Circular reasoning is a logical fallacy only when it is arbitrary, proving nothing beyond what it assumes. However, not all circular reasoning is fallacious, as I just said. Certain standards must be assumed. Dr. Jason, how do you say this name? Leslie. 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 Leslie gave an example of a non-arbitrary use of circular reasoning. Without the laws of logic, we cannot make an argument. We can make an argument. Therefore, there must be laws of logic. Okay? 
Within the, while this argument is circular, it is not a fallacious use of circular reasoning. Since we could not prove anything apart from the laws of logic, we must presuppose the laws of logic even to prove they exist. In fact, if someone were trying to disprove the laws that the laws of logic ex exist, he would have to use the law laws of logic in his attempt, thereby refuting himself. This is what we call either a self-defeating argument, and this is why the laws of logic are known in some books as first principles. Okay? They are so foundationally basic that any attempt to get around them uses them in the assertion. Let me give you an example. This sentence is not in English. I don't exist. Why is that self-defeating? In order for me to say I don't exist, do I have to do I have to exist? Yes. So you, there you have there you have the law of being and and, and 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 so on and so forth involved in all that. We don't have time to get into all that stuff. Now, the independent. This is important. The independent and extra biblical evidence afforded by history and archaeology serves to break the cycle. If the Bible can prove to be correct in all areas in which it can be checked extra-biblically, then we have the most compelling evidence for accepting its spiritual truth claims, its own teaching regarding its own inspiration. Anywhere on this cycle could we look at, okay, the Bible is the Word of God, because the Bible tells us so, the Bible is infallible. Could we go and look at extra-biblical material, extra-biblical things that would prove that the Bible is true? Yeah. yeah. Okay? So don't let anybody get you all bent out of shape talking to you about circular reasoning. You've got to understand it and use it appropriately and effectively. And even that person has certain axiomatic presuppositions that they are using. Now, I know that I'm using some sort of big language here, and hopefully you haven't missed the point here on, on that, this, this, this final point of this lesson, but you gotta understand that this sort of, this sort of charge is out there and it is common, all right? So we have a few, we're, we're right at 10 o'clock. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Mike? Is circular reasoning different from uh, what's commonly called begging the question, which is usually listed on their logical policies? Um, because that clearly is a, a policy, right? Begging the question. I'm, I'm trying to, Nate, you might be able to help me out here. Begging the question is an informal fallacy. Yes. Whereas true, a true error in circular reasoning would be a formal fallacy, right? Yeah, because that's this is yeah in the lines of if you're putting it out with uh, prepositions and conclusion, informal begging question yeah is more of a spoken one. It's more along the lines of you've made a mistake somewhere and what you've been saying, and ultimately <coughs> it basically accomplishes the same thing. I would think in the end, yes. And I think that it, it sort of, it accomplishes... If you accused of teaching, begging the question, you're assuming your conclusion in your propositions. It's a similar... You're dismissed. <laughs> it, it's a similar um, outcome, I'll put it that way. Begging the question and, and circular reasoning. But if you look in philosophy books they will categorize begging the question as an informal fallacy, whereas a uh, circular reasoning is, is categorized as a formal fallacy. To beg a question means to assume the conclusion of an argument. This is an informal fa fallacy in which the arguer includes the conclusion to be proven within a premise of the argument, often in an indirect way such that it is its presence within the premise is hidden or at least not easily apparent. Do you get all that? So in other words, it's, it's, it's functionally it's functionally doing the same thing as circular reasoning. Would Something you agree with that? Synonymously. Yeah. yeah. They're basically the same. They're basically, the outcome would be the same if somebody wants to go that route. All right. Any other questions, comments? So we will finish up this study next week by talking about limitations of inspiration.